What's up, what's up, what's up, movie nerds, movie geeks, movie cinephiles, whatever you choose to go by nowadays. Welcome to Back to the Classics, the cinematic movie podcast that takes you back to the iconic films of 20 years ago. I am Jay Alonzo. K. Williams is normally with us, but this week he is uh, down due to technical difficulties, but without a doubt we still miss K. K. will be back with us next week, but we have a special, special guest on BTTC. I am honored to have this man on here. He is a brother of mine. He's actually an actual blood brother of mine. I've been on his show several times, and now he's going to hang out with us, hop into the DeLorean with us, and do our show with us today. With that being said, please welcome one half of the noise, Big Los. What's going on, Los? With the trifecta three times in your ear, like water for chocolate, the noise, of course, and now I'm here at Back to the Classics. Feels good. You're, uh, on, you're on tour right now. What's going I'm on? I'm on tour. I'm on tour, and I'm very much so stagnant at the same time. Yeah, you're on your Diddy shit right now. For sure. Super you know, duper on your Diddy This shit. is the most unintentional monopoly when it comes down to my own shit. So. But, but, but we thank you for standing in. You know? Of course, of course. Absolutely. Uh, now, uh, with, with Back to the Classics, uh, something that uh, it was a brainchild of uh, me and you, and, uh, and we thank you. Much mostly much, you, but yeah. Mostly me, yeah. But I do I know for the fact that the listeners definitely thank you. And um, with this being your first official uh, appearance on Back to the Classics, I got to treat you like you're one of our honored guests to be a part of the show. Right. People already know who you are, but let's get to down to who, actual, you know, who, who Big Los actually is. So let's kick it off with... Uh, who the hell are you? My name is Carlos Sampson, but of course, as the world knows me as Big Los, I'm a Libra. I like long walks on the beach. I'm sensitive. <laughs> I like to be held at night. That's held uh, tight at night. Tight. Tight. And that's uh, the gist. Um, it's not much that they don't know about me. If they follow BTTC, then it's a good chance that they follow the noise, and it's a good and it's a very strong chance that they follow our highest listened to show, like Water for Chocolate. Shout out. So at this point, if the listeners, the followers of Beat Network don't know me. Mm-hmm. They're not listening that hard. Yeah, man. I'm just uh, I'm just a dude that loves entertainment and loves media and loves fair media at that. Mm. Um, and I'm a little biased. I love black media. Mm-hmm. <laughs> of course, because there's nothing better. You know. You know, we make it strides. Black excellence is a true thing. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah. I'm just, I'm ready to have fun with this. I've been seeing... Um, y'all, I've been listening to y'all show. Of course, I, I put it out, so of course I listen to it. Right, right. Um, there's a few times, and I got some quarrels with so with some of the things y'all been doing. So I think it's the first or the second episode. K beat you in two minute drill. You you just elected yourself the winner. <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah, I promise. People, go back and listen. And let me know if I'm tripping. But which I, which he, episode? I got it was either the first or the second one. He beat you. And you were just like, I mean, well, I won that. <laughs> like, <laughs> I was like, wait, wait, I, the mathematics ain't adding up. I don't like your trigonometry. Okay. K, if you're listening, I'm sure you are. K, if you're listening, you got robbed, bro. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, looking out bro. for the mob. It's my brother, my blood brother. I'm looking out for the mob today. <laughs> okay, <Cheap>. so <laughs> so when the Beat Network biopic comes together, <laughs> who's playing Big Los in the Beat Network biopic? I can't remember my, my man's name, but there was a Buffalo Wild Wings commercial that came out not too long ago, <laughs> and it was like this this big bald brother with a goatee. According to my frat brother, Albert Bailey, that's my twin, so I'm gunning for him. But if not him, then probably... Uh, so action number two from Buffalo Wild Wings. Basically, right. And you, everybody's going to play low, so they're uh-huh. not like a mainstream guy, but when the Beat Network biopic come out, I'm turning cats into celebrities out here. Like, this is going to be their Jamie Foxx and Ray so when they play low. Or matter of fact, we're going for it. Not even fresh faces. Like, you know, if, if people have seen me, then if this dude grows a beard, then probably the ain't shit husband from um, Diary of a Mad Black Woman. Probably can get him to play me. Blair? No, 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 Blair no, 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 no. That was... Uh, oh, uh, you talking about uh, uh, Steve Ferris? Yes, I was about okay, to say yeah, uh, yeah, Wood yeah. Harris's brother. Yeah, 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 Steve Ferris. So he probably could step in and play your boy. <laughs> um, obviously, you can go grab Rick Ross. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and um, but that's the thing though. It's like I don't talk like Ross, so he'll be in my shows. And when he comes down to black media, <laughs> you gotta be different. Welcome to the noise. Like oh. I know I breathe a lot. I'm a big dude, but that's like hella breath that we truly don't need to be portraying big lows. And I think it, I think the beard has a certain smell to it. So. Not mine. Mine smells amazing. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I'm just saying, you, know. you know. Anyway, yeah, Ross got too much money for his beard to smell like. 
Like, he just been eating ass all day. I doubt his smell oh, like that. Oh, God. So, are you ready for two-minute drill, sir? Sir, I am. I'm ready to defend the blue and white. Okay. I'm ready right. to come on your show mm-hmm. and show your ass up. Okay. Just a little background for everybody. I am Jay Alonzo's younger brother. So, there's been a lot of in the shadow I've helped, I've had to deal with. So, understand, today is... Don't make this uh, personal. Today is a culmination of 27 years... Why are you making it personal? ...of playing the background. And it today, no I'm sense. here to take center stage. I am here to show his ass up. And then we're going to talk about, spoiler alert, this boring-ass movie. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had somebody tell me today that... Uh, I can't believe you're doing this movie today. Like this is, this is my favorite movie. I'm like, have you actually seen this movie? That's how I know that there has to be something deeply rooted still with you dealing with me. Because out of all movies, I mean, you did set it off. You did uh, Mars Attacks. You did all these movies. And then you finally come to me for for this movie. <laughs> that we'll it won't be later. just this movie. Man, we had this conversation already where I told you, me and you will definitely do a movie that relates to us as both film fans and as actual blood brothers. Now, so with, that, now with that sentence, uh-huh. think about this. With that sentence, the first movie you asked me to come on is Beverly Hills Ninja. No, boom! It, there it is. <laughs> what that was that, that, that there was was, was a, a cry for help because my partner in crime is not here this week. Oh but, man, yeah. So anyway, two minute drill. So for those who are new to the show, two minute drill is a part of the show where myself and Cade normally, but today we got Big Los in the building. We ask each other, we rapid fire questions back and forth to each other to make sure that we watch the movie that we're going to talk about today. And uh, in two minutes, we will see who got the most answers, in which case, the person will kick off the notes for real talk. And uh, we're going to get going. Los, are you ready for two-minute drill? Let's get it. All right, and two-minute drill starts now. Robin Shaw plays Gobai in this movie. Name the character and the movie he's also known for. Oh, Liu Kang, Mortal Kombat, baby. All right. Come on now. Okay. See, I, I didn't come here to be that nice to you. So, <laughs> what was the name of the boat that Chris Farley's character, Haru, arrived on? And they show the name of the boat. They do. I don't think I paid that much attention. I know you did. Oh, man. Uh, uh, white ninja guy? White ninja guy, that's what yeah. they call the boat? No, that's incorrect. Right. <laughs> the boat was called Old Lucky. Okay. So that's 1-0. Okay. I'm keeping tally. 1-0. All right, okay. The villain has a direct connection to another character in this movie. Name that connection. <laughs> the villain? Oh, uh, Sally Jones, a.k.a. Allison something. But Sally Jones was her original name. <laughs> but that's not the villain, though. The, no, you said she has a connection to one other character, right? But name the connection. Oh, this is his girlfriend. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, 2-0. What was the name of the medallions that the ninjas got upon completion? Y'all you should, really sat and watched the movie. Y'all should see movie. his face, people. <laughs> y'all should see his face. What's it called? Is that a buzzer? That's a buzzer. That's a buzzer. Yeah, yeah. It's called the Medallion of the Tingu Warrior. You really watched the movie. Okay. I'm, 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 I'm happy for you. Before becoming Haru's apprentice, what was Joey's occupation? He was a bellman. Correct. All right. Um, okay, I'll give you an easier one. Okay, yeah. Don't be buzz. My fucking show. With this cameo. No, somebody made a cameo in this movie that Haru mistaked for Sally Jones. Who was that? Ah, uh, Fabio. Yes. Yeah, yes, yes. yeah. That one I knew. Asshole. So that's 3 1. Shit, I think we've got about 20 seconds left. Does this movie hold up? Is that is that a that's two a minute, legit two minute drill question? Fuck no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, who played Chet Walters? Will Sasso. Yeah. Mm. What's that? Three for no, who? Do, do, two for me. Four for me. Four for you. All right. Uh, I think we got like five seconds left. Uh. Uh. uh, uh All right. Time. Time. Let's get it. <laughs> and um, your winner. Well, as you can see, uh, Big Love decided to come through my show, show me up on my own damn show, and I'm the actual movie fan of the family. But uh, I guess we'll do that now. Now, listen, I had some, I had some shit for you. Understand? <laughs> the uh, one of the questions I had was, what were the three things Haru vowed to do while the ninjas were on their first exercise as ninjas? Uh Okay, two minute drill is over, so I'm, I'm gonna just think this one through. He decided to put on, on a ninja outfit and kind of do his little fashion show. And no, no, no. What did he vow to his sensei? Oh, uh, uh, uh he vowed three things. 
Damn. Right. I don't know. It was protect the land, guard the dojo, and water the plants. Another one. What was the actual name of the dojo? He said it like six times in the movie. I I, I honestly thought it was called the dojo. No. It was the Takaguru Dojo. Takaguru Dojo. Yeah. <laughs> I came prepared watching this hot garbage <laughs> of a movie. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. I'm 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 going I'm going to give you these movie facts and you can go into real talk since you're just that damn good that oh, I'm a guest, baby. Movie. I'm going after you. <laughs> For those who do not know the movie we are talking about, we are taking it back to January of 1997 and we're taking it back to the late great Chris Farley classic or lack thereof. Beverly Hills Ninja, aka the cinematic form of a dog shitting. Of a dog shitting. Um, Los, uh, when was the last time before today? I'm sure you watched it today. When was the last time you watched Beverly Hills Ninja? Dude, I couldn't even tell you. And you know what's funny? I was sitting around thinking while I was watching this slow death. I was just like, why did I like this movie as a child? And then I really had to think. I don't think I liked this movie as a child. Yeah. I just think. It, it, I think it used to play like three times a day on Stars and Encore. <laughs> Even before then, I remember when it was getting released, and uh, I remember seeing the poster around LA a lot. And uh, you know, that, yes, we were living in LA. Yeah, when this and, came and, out. and at that time, Chris Farley was such a a powerhouse of a, of a star. You know, he still had the Tommy Boy fame. He had the uh, the fame from Black Sheep and. Still a SNL um, legend, if you will. So yeah, when, when the movie was getting ready to come out, I remember just driving around LA with with with, with the family and seeing uh, the uh, the orange and white silhouette uh, one sheet of Chris Farley and and the, the tagline being "Kung Fu," which was the probably oh, yeah, the best yeah, they could yeah, come yeah, up yeah, with yeah. at that time. So yeah, I, the first time we seen the movie, it, I think it was already well into being on VHS. So we definitely seen it in theaters. You know what I didn't realize when I was younger. Chris Rock was not needed in this movie at all. Like his character could have been anybody, but it's definitely a quick hits. Who uh, Orlando Jones is probably supposed to play him? <laughs> no, no. But you'd be surprised to know how Chris Rock actually ended up in the movie. It had to be like a, a Saturday Night Live favorite. But I will right, we'll oh, clearly, that. clearly it was. But you know, here we go. Beverly Hills Ninja original release date January seventeenth, nineteen ninety seven. Shares opening weekend with Metro. That great piece of cinema i would have rather done metro today well hey stick with us brother you go far domestic total gross 31 million dollars on a budget of 18 million currently sitting at a 14 percent on rotten tomatoes that is, is that fair that is generous is that fair that is generous as hell. <laughs> this should have been the first negative rating on rotten tomatoes i'm like you when, when, when i put I, I literally watched this movie about an hour ago and this is a tough one to get through. A movie that's an hour and 29 minutes long feels so much longer. It's like the day. So let's get into this thing. Real Talk. Real Talk is a part of the show where we begin to go over our notes for the movie that we just watched. And uh, we'll talk about it. Kicking off Real Talk. They find a, a white baby in a chest. On what boat? Uh, 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 the Freedom Fighter. The old lucky. The old lucky. Okay. I was about to call it the old boy, but I had to, I had to look back at my notes. So I was like, what was the old boy. And I thought it was weird because they never really explained as to where this baby came from or why the baby is actually in a chest with no holes poked in it. So how's the baby breathing? There's a lot of questions. There's a lot of questionable stuff going on with this opening scene. But uh, it kicks off what we know as uh, uh, the opening uh, montage for Beverly Hills Ninja. We do know that the uh, the ninjas are able to uh, adopt this this kid, and then we see the kid as a as a small kid training with the other ninjas, and then immediately we get Chris Farley and Robin Shaw with Luke Kang. I rather call him Luke Kang in this movie in this, in this interview in this review, mm-hmm. and I think from jump it immediately takes you back to when. You first seen Chris Farley doing his thing on SNL, and he was really and man, and God bless the dead. Chris Farley's whole shtick was running into shit and mm-hmm. hurting himself and being very reactionary to a lot of stuff. Oh, 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 oh. And I, I thought the same thing, but um, I actually just saw something not so long ago. I, I want to say it's on VH1 or E, but it was um, I guess the untold story of Chris Farley. Mm. And that kind of made me sympathize with what he was doing in movies around that time because around that time he had 
no other option but to be that slapstick fat guy. Mm -hmm. So that was his entire thing. Like, just do the most outlandish, the most demeaning shit to make everybody laugh because it's only funny because you're fat and doing it. Right. You know, sad to say, you know, again, God bless the dead. But that's ultimately what led to his death. He mm -hmm. was depressed. He was like that. He didn't want to be known as the fat guy in movies. He wanted to be seen as a credible actor. Mm -hmm. Beverly Hills Ninja did not help that. Not at all. I believe uh, after Beverly Hills Ninja, we also got uh, uh, Almost Heroes. Shit, I Matthew forgot Perry. about that. Same year, by the way. The same year oh, as, so that's uh, coming up, isn't it? Yeah. I believe so. This, 97 was not a good year to Chris Farley. You know what? I rap, but you know what? Almost Heroes wasn't too bad. Compared wasn't, to this. It wasn't horrible. It wasn't good or great. But compared, it wasn't, to, compared to this, Almost Heroes was actually a plot surprise, if, right. if anything. But uh, this is actually, unfortunately, the, the same year. He had Beverly Hills Ninja, then Almost Heroes, and then he died. Yep. Yeah, so same year. So, And fun fact, I don't know, you may have this in your quick hits. This is also the same year he started Shrek. That is true. Mm -hmm. That is very true. They had to cancel it after he passed away. Yep. So, um, we get through the training montage. And then uh, the sensei is uh, awarding his ninjas who, who's passed the training. And obviously, uh, in that training montage, we get uh, Liu Kang lifting up the uh, the branding, if you will. I'm sure you guys know a lot about that being uh, Greeks and all. Mm -hmm. uh, they're doing the branding. And in typical, typical Chris Farley fashion, he picks up the same bowl the witch's brew, and then drops it, drops hot water all over the damn dojo. Typical Chris Farley. And somehow, it, it still came out perfect further down in the movie. We're going to talk about it, because yeah. obviously it was yeah. needed mm -hmm. in the movie. Mm -hmm. But somehow, the shit still came out perfectly. Mm -hmm. But okay. So when Sensei is uh, he's out there, and he's giving all the ninjas who, who pass training their medallions and all that, and obviously Chris Farley, oh, correction, Haru, mm -hmm. thinking that he's going to get a medallion. He's, you know, Sally mistaken, as yeah. we pretty much know. And then uh, the next scene is, is when uh, they're getting ready to go on a mission. And they need Haru to kind of kick back and kind of guard the dojo. In his mind, he can't wait to go up in there and start just playing with shit. Right. And just being a big-ass kid. And I guess this is supposed to symbolize the bull in the china shop, basically. Mm -hmm. So as he's in there being a ninja at the time, Sally Jones... Sally Jones, played Sally by Jones. Nicolette Sheridan. I haven't seen her in anything other than this movie. Uh, no, she was in, um, remember Spy Hard with Leslie Nielsen? Oh, wow. She's, she's like the, the lead chick in that, too. Besides those that's two, where That's where it ends, isn't that, it? Yeah. I can't think of nothing else I've probably seen her in in yep. the last, like, 10, 15 years. I blame this movie. Yep. But um, Nicolette Jones, no, I'm sorry, Sally Jones. <laughs> Sally Jones pop up, mm -hmm. and um, she's seeking the assistance of a ninja. She's trying to find out what's going on with her husband because he could possibly be up to some shady stuff. She just shows up looking for a ninja. Yeah, exactly. And she, here's my question, though. How did she get there? Because if, if you remember... That, during that, the, that's my note. If you remember, I don't know about that. <laughs> if, you remember, if you remember during the training session, you don't see no roads. They're like on the top of this mountain and ain't nothing but water. Even in the it's end. It's a very secluded area. It's a very secluded area, mm -hmm. but Sally found that shit with no problem. So if you can find this hidden dojo, why can't you find out what's going on with your husband? And the dumbest ninja found out that day what was going on. But anyway, so she, she goes looking, she goes and search for a ninja, and the only one she comes across is Chris Farley. And at this time, Haru is trying to convince her that he's a ninja. Uh, he says that one of his specialties, or his highest grade, was um, stealth. Mm -hmm. And that's where you go into classic Chris Farley. He jumps through one of the Asian windows. I don't know what the hell they're called, but it's called an Asian window for right now. <laughs> Um, for all intents and purposes. For all intents and purposes. He jumped out purposes. of an Asian window. He jumped out of an Asian window and then pops up on the other end. Somehow she missed that gigantic manhole in said Asian window. But that's, you know, one of the many flaws with this movie. So once he convinces her that he's the ninja for the job, he goes... With his ninja intuition. With his ninja intuition. Mm -hmm. He finally goes to check up on her husband... And finds out that he is a counterfeit money dealer. It's crazy because at this time, in movies in, in 1997, the bad guy was all was always this British yep. dude. You know, not very threatening, but that British accent, like, oh, okay, there's your bad guy. Right there. We just found it, the <laughs> villain. And then he had he had he had a henchman. You couldn't really make out if he was half Asian, half white, or 
or whatever. But he had that really slick goatee. He kind of looked like Jen with hair. Mm. Mm-hmm. For anybody that remembers Jen. So yeah, he finds out that the husband is a counterfeit money dealer. And then he also witnesses the husband shoot a man in mm-hmm. the head. Mm-hmm. And the man lands right in Haru's boat because he's sneaking under the docks in mm-hmm. the boat. The man lands in Haru's boat and the cops see Haru with the dead guy in his boat. So he's instantly the murder suspect. He's, he's, he's merely pinned the suspect, which, which he has to go back now to the dojo. And with Sensei... Um, Hold on, be- before you get to that... Too far? No, 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 it's, it's not too far. I just wanted to touch base on that as well. Another thing that's just wrong with this fucking movie. You gonna sit here and tell me you watch this fat ass with a dead body in a blow up boat <laughs> just float away and no one could stop him. No one shot the boat. No one shot him. Nothing. None of that. They were just like, it was a fat ninja. What do we do from here? Like, y'all some shit cops, boy. <laughs> well, that cause, you know, it's funny because it, it, if they said oh, it was a fat ninja, it goes back to uh, a, a line that's said in the movie where, well, you're the fat ninja everyone's talking about, aren't you? I guess so. Your British accent is terrible. No, I know. <laughs> and so when, when, when Haru gets back to the dojo and he's talking to Sensei, obviously the Sensei is against what he's trying to do because he's really doing it because he's trying to get with Sally Jones. Mm-hmm. And... The sensei is looking at him more like, I need to get him the fuck out of my dojo. And so he gives him the green light to go to L.A., obviously making uh, uh, Robin Chow, Liu Kang's character, kind of follow suit and be a ninja and follow him to L.A. Mm. But then we get L.A. Now, the L.A. part at the airport was always littered with questions because as he goes through the security checkpoint... He pulls out a barrage of weapons that would never fly that would never get onto a plane. <laughs> and it's like for comedic for, for comedic purposes, he pulls out what two uh, two swords. He, he has two swords. He has ninja stars, and then he also has some. I don't know. It just looked like a uh, it looked like a '90s rapper chain. I don't know what the hell it was, but it was obviously to do to wreck some shit. But you would definitely not get onto no plane, especially at LAX, with all that shit. As soon face. as you, as soon as you pulled out the Ninja Stars, it's like, nope, security. That that'll be in the movie credits. <laughs> and another thing that, that I noticed about that, once he gets through that situation, and then uh, now he's uh, he's in his rental car, which by the way, he stabs up the fucking rental car, which is unbelievable to me. Speaking of that, this man technically does not have an identity. How did he rent a car? What license? He has no ID. They just trusted. First of all, he sne- he tried to sneak weapons on a plane. That's already some time. Flag <laughs> number one. And and then you're gonna rent a car to a man with no ID, mm. no driver's license, no history. Basically, it's like, oh, okay, here you go. I don't remember it being that easy back then. You remember this? Okay, so th- there's a song that plays in this movie that it's it's got '90s juice written all over it, and uh, uh, I believe the song is called "Turning Japanese." But I do know the hook goes, I'm turning Japanese, I'm turning Japanese, I think so. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Turn that which mod- is very racist, by which the is way. super <laughs> racist, you know. But 90s at the time, they didn't really care. Like, uh, I think it was you who showed me um, those, those, those countdowns on, on YouTube to where, like, the top 10 songs with other meanings that didn't, you know, that, mm-hmm. that they don't really convey. The turning Japanese song, which is clearly not made by anyone Japanese. But it's a song about getting high. Yeah. That's why it's so racist. It's totally something about getting high. It has <laughs> nothing to do with Japanese. It is Japan a song at all. about blowing a blunt and having low <laughs> eyes. And that's what we get And to, now we put this in a movie with a white ninja. <laughs> yeah. And we get to say, and while that song's playing and he's in his rental car, he's driving, he's swerving crazy up and down LA streets. Now, once again, that's a red flag because if you drive like that in LA, it's not too long down the road, you'll see those blue and whites behind you. Right. Because that's how LAPD gets down. And around that, around that time, LAPD was with the shits. Yes. They, they, they were down to whoop that ass. Yes. No problem. Oh, with Luke Kang in the trunk, by the with way. With Luke Kang in the trunk, absolutely. Which, how do you know which car he was going to rent? Ninja. Okay. No matter what, every answer is going to be Ninja. So this is when we get uh, our first look at uh, Chris Rock. Chris Rock's character, name is Joey. Works at the, uh, the hotel that uh, Haru checks into. Now... Going back to what you were saying earlier, I honestly, like you, feel like Chris Rock has absolutely no place in this movie. This was the one character they didn't cast, I can promise you. <laughs> absolutely no place I, in the movie. They went to film and was like, shit, we don't have a bell. <laughs> but um, but he, he finds Chris Rock. 
Chris Rock immediately is just on his dick because, you know, oh, you're a ninja and he's a disgruntled employee. So let's just make magic together. So Chris Rock goes from being a bellhop to an apprentice in less than like 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. So when, you know, after that scene goes by and then Chris Rock and then Haru, they go outside to uh, find Haru some clothes and now he needs to find... Uh, Sally Jones, and he knows he's not gonna find it in uh, in his ninja getup. So where does he go? He goes to get a pimp outfit. Bring on the laughs, right? So chuckle. So and, and it's funny too because he, he actually walks around L.A. primarily Beverly Hills, looking at every long haired woman and immediately assuming that that's Sally Jones, including Fabio. Fabio, long haired blonde woman. Long haired blonde woman. Is I think his uh, the line was. Um, we, all we have to do is look for a rich blonde in Beverly Hills. It shouldn't be that hard. Now, that was supposed to be funny, but I'm like, it's fucking stupid. Yeah, it makes no sense. I mean, granted, rich blondes in Beverly Hills are a dime a dozen. Literally. But, I mean, you, he literally walked to every woman like, Sally Jones? You know what else I noticed? In, you know what else I noticed in this movie? Every woman was blonde. Yeah. Every last woman in this movie mm-hmm. is blonde. Mm-hmm. That's 1997 LA for you. No, nah, I think they purposely made it like that just for this movie because there wasn't a brunette. And it's in L.A. in the 90s when nobody with green spikes walking around there. Every woman was blonde. Not in Beverly Hills. Not, not in Beverly Hills, the, 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 the hairstyle to beat is the blonde hairstyle. Oh, okay. That's what it is. But he eventually does see Sally. And I never forget this line. I, I, I wrote it down as a note. He says, you said you needed a ninja. And now I've traveled many miles disguised as a pimp. To help you. <laughs> now, that was the only scene that really did give me like a, a, a little giggle. This is my first time chuckling at it. That's just because <laughs> of how you said it. It had nothing to do with Chris. Well, the thing with, with Chris's character, Chris is talking with such a, a weird vernacular. Like It's almost like he's trying to be international, but you're obviously white. Right. No, sensei. I can never go down that down that path. Da, 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 da. It's like, well, you weren't born there. Right. You just happen to end up there. Right. You know? So, when he's talking to people, and he's kind of talking with, I wouldn't necessarily call it broken English, but he's talking with a certain, are you, are you, are your words coming together right? He's, he's technically a ninja. You know, and that is funny that he ended up wherever the hell the dojo is. He ended up there as a baby and don't speak a lick of their language. It turns out all the ninjas speak English, apparently. <laughs> so in between that time, he finds out where the exchange is going to happen. Because one thing I actually didn't mention was they found out that there was an issue with the plates. Now, this is the, the boyfriend, uh, Martin, was it like Tank? Um, Martin Tinsley? Martin something with a T. But anyway, around this time, you find out that they only have the front plates. They need the back plates. Mm. So it, it was a Yakuza gang that stole the other plates. They meet up at a strip club to make the exchange. And I guess, it's, I guess it's a Yakuza strip club. Haru is going through trying to find out, you know, where they at, where is it going down? And this is his first experience at a strip club. So he peeks behind one curtain and finds out this is where the strippers are. Mm. And funny, <laughs> funny note with this. That had to be the worst stripper I have ever seen. In first, coming from the generation of Players <laughs> Club, that was the worst stripper I've ever seen in a movie. There's nothing. There's nothing enticing about her, like pulling up her. her it's her like top. she she was playing with her B cups in front of Chris Farley, and then he was to getting enticed, and then she did this horrible twerk <laughs> that got him like going, and now all of a sudden he's a stripper, which. I thought that was a clever part because it, it's a cool callback to um, the skit that he used to do on the Chippendale SNL. skit. The Chippendale yeah, yeah, skit. Yeah, yeah. So I thought it was a cool thing. callback to that. But in that position where he goes, uh, I am one of the universe. I am one of the universe. I think she you know, does that, that long back twerk that she does. And he goes, no, was, I am not. It was like a seizure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, and he goes into the whole, no, I am not. I never understood. Granted, I know, I think that they put that scene in there to kind of be that uh, nostalgia factor for the Chippendales thing he, he was doing us now. In real life, 
you see a stripper and you're so turned on by the stripper, I'm going to go out there and strip as well. Right. You think like, okay, I'm going to fuck with the stripper. No, it's time to show her what I'm, I I'm can gonna go do. Out there and strip as well. It is now my turn. Another thing, too, when we mentioned this before, Liu Kang, I can't remember his name in the movie. Liu Kang is uh, hiding. Go by. Go by. Go by is hiding in plain sight this entire movie. And this is a man you grew up knowing as your brother. You don't see him any of these times, like get the fuck out of here. Speaking of which, Gobai has, in my opinion, the most cracking perm. I've Yo, his his perm is pop. His hot comb game is ridiculous. I mean, delicate. That shit is laid, son. Delicateness. <laughs> um. So yeah. So he's stripping while the exchange is going on. You cut back to the boyfriend, and you find out that the yakuza is actually trying to buy the plates from him. Mm-hmm. And that he wouldn't, he wasn't trying to give him the opportunity to buy the other plates back. So now it was basically a double cross. Mm. So I, I know that next scene is when um, uh, Haru sees Sally Jones, or who he thinks is Sally Jones, pull up to the uh, to the boyfriend's house. Mm-hmm. However, her uh, her license plate says Allison P. So that's when my, my note here says Sally Jones is not Sally Jones, right? So, yeah, big old bubble burster there. And then uh, he starts to piece stuff together, you know, to realize, well, why did you lie to me? And then uh, she said, I didn't want you to get hurt. I, it, you know what? Certain movies that have a character, a female character in there, and she's introduced to us as a certain name. And then later on in the movie, that's not her real name. This is her real name. In movies, I, I can't think of one at the top of my head, so don't ask me. But in movies where, like, that particular thing works... It's like, yeah, okay, well, I, I can kind of understand why she decided to, to change her name for that particular thing. It makes no fucking sense here. Nope. She's Sally Jones. Okay, I get that. But she's also uh, Allison P. or Eloise Jones or whatever the hell she's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. What's the point of changing your name? She, I, she said that she didn't want it to be known that she was trying to hire a ninja. I think that's what she said. Mm. But even then, what does changing your name mean? change about any of that so so this is when we get to, the, to that uh, Benihana's like place I don't think they actually called it Benihana's but I think it's Benihana's mm-hmm. and uh, wait on oh, we skipped a scene oh, we yeah. gotta remember he went to the the uh, the mountains of enlightenment to meet with his sensei when he first got to the hotel and even that's a fat joke right waiting to happen right you know just unnecessary floating and he went to this he went to the sensei in an outer body experience um, to talk to him about the mission, and the sensei gave him some kind words, I guess. And when he flew back, fat joke time, mm-hmm. the his outer body flew back into his inner body, and, and he went crashing through the, the window, window again. Yeah, and I, that's I, when we ended up on the scene with Allison. I, I can tell you, um, hey yo, fuck that janitor too, man. He st- them shoes was nice as hell when he was dressed as a pimp. I'm like, <laughs> you gonna just steal my shit? You gonna throw them away? <laughs> fuck you. You know what? If I had a a, a penny. Every time he crashed through a window or something fell on him or he fell on something, I'd, I'd be rich because this whole movie is primarily Chris Farley falling into shit. And being loud. And being loud doing it. And I'm just like, that was the whole comedy bit back in them days. Mm-hmm. You know? This is when uh, we see, uh, once again, Goatee. And uh, isn't the, the British dude there too? Yeah. Okay. It's Jen and it's Mark or Matt, Mike. Mm-hmm. And once again, Go By is there and he's now in drag now. Mm-hmm. He Ob- just looks like Go By in drag. I'm observing the entire thing. Right? At the same table that Haru is cooking at. Because now Haru is disguised as, as a cook. As a cook, right. And even that scene, which is like, none of this seems weird to anybody. <laughs> to anybody. Like, you've seen the same fat ass dude in various places where you know he don't belong. So now here you are at the restaurant, and guess guess who, who's your cook? You're at a hibachi grill. You know they gets it in. You got the one cook that can't cook. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody questioned that. Like, hey, bro, can we get another dude? This fat ass man. <laughs> get him. Damn. But uh, is, is that this time to win? Uh, I think this is when Allison shows up again, and then the fight breaks out. So Haru is basically taking out henchmen without realizing he's taking out henchmen. Mm-hmm. Once again, in full drag. 
Here comes go by, beat motherfuckers up mm-hmm. in full drag. And I, I forgot the line that he says when he's like punching out some dude. You know how long it took for me to do my hair. <laughs> but the motherfucker has on a wig. And then why do you have on a wig if your hair is so luxurious already? Like, just style that shit up. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, Haru and Allison end up escaping together. Right. And now, Allison mm-hmm. is hiding out at Haru's hotel. Mm-hmm. And during this time, Haru sees Allison getting changed via silhouette behind another Asian door that's at Yeah, in this. typical 90s fashion. Exactly, that's at Allison the Allison shows hotel. her silhouette, which looks good, and then Haru shows his silhouette, which looks fucking... Well, it looks just terrible. Now, fat. I'm a big dude, and again, God bless the dead, Chris Farley looked uncomfortably fat. Like, that's just, like, that's that waddle, and you know what I'm saying? But he was, I can't really say athletic, but he was... You know, he was a pretty limber individual for some of the stuff he was yeah, doing in the movie. Yeah, absolutely. But, yeah, so they end up at, back at the hotel kind of to stash Allison. Now they're they're seeing Will Sasso's character who goes by the name of Chet Walters. Mm-hmm. And during this time with Chet, he's actually, he's a printing press worker or an exec something. And they're going in, they're going in there to find out about what's going on, what, what's his affiliation with Martin. So, this whole time, Allison, who we now discover her name is Allison, she's trying to distract Chet, and Haru is trying to knock Chet out. Mm -hmm. Fails miserably. Mm -hmm. Which leads Allison to catch Chet with the right hook, and ends up putting him out. Haru, it looks like he's like crushing up some like walnuts or something, I don't know what it was, but he's crushing up these nuts, and blows it in Chet's face. Chet sneezes and it hits Haru. So now, every, so now apparently this is a truth telling formula. So now everybody is just high off of this truth. They're laughing formula. off this. Just, they're this laughing, shit. Yeah. and Chet is revealing his entire operation mm-hmm. with with Martin. And then eventually Chet falls back, and I want to say he dies, low key, because that they was, never they never explain what happened. It's like Chet. he was laughing hard, and then you was this bubble, and then it was just dead. I think Chet had a heart attack. Chet might have had a heart I attack. I think he had a heart attack. So now that Chet's out of the game, Chris Farley disguises himself as Chet, and Martin and Jen show up to go over the actual plate so they can get all the money printed. Mm-hmm. Now he's undercover again, and the only difference is, is the mustache. And like you said before, nobody recognized this man from the Hibachi Grill. That's now Chet. <laughs> and... They go along. They go on his. But to his defense, though, he has the Chet uh, imitation down packed, though, because Chet was a, a motherfucker who just really do have the the jokes coming. Will Sasso and Chris Farley were some huge dudes, mm-hmm. so when they laugh, you feel it just from watching the movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they definitely they both had that laugh, and I guess that's how they knew Chet to be anyway. So Chris Farley was keeping that going. So they end up blindfolding Chris Farley. And driving to the uh, the printing press where they mm-hmm. actually make the money. Mm-hmm. They get to the printing press. Chris Farley's just being Chris Farley. Of course, right behind him is Luke Kang. He Chris Farley ends up losing his mustache, getting a sip of water. Luke Kang comes in, does some ninja shit, and throws the mustache back, back on, on his face. Perfectly back on his face. Perfectly back mm-hmm. on his face. Martin tells Jen to watch Haru as Chet as they're printing up the money. Haru acts like something went wrong. He ended up printing the money a bright ass, like tangerine orange. And, um, like Monopoly money. Exactly. It, it looked like fake money. Mm-hmm. So that was his way to distract them while he stole the plates. And he was almost out the room until one of the plates fell out of his pocket. Like we knew it would. And you know what? You know something I've noticed? We legitimately haven't talked about Chris Rock this entire review. And that's because he was so irrelevant. <laughs> He's so these irrelevant parts of the movie. to the movie. It's like. He's only there to simply be the Chris black Rock. guy. He was there. Yeah. He was there for the for the minority aspect of it. <laughs> I mean, I mean, even with, with the shit, he, the, the classic shit he does with his hands. Like you're literally there to be Chris Rock. Just to catch y'all up, there's a part where he's chasing a chicken. That's actually the majority of what he's doing throughout the movie as they mm-hmm. go back and forth to the hotel. He chases mm-hmm. a chicken, mm-hmm. Chris Rock, ladies and gentlemen. Mm-hmm. So now Haru's caught. He's tied up, placed into the back of a van. Now Allison is coming to help him out. Mm-hmm. Allison breaks him out. Well, 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 wait. Once they discovered that Haru was obviously not Chet, then that's when that's that's when we get the uh, the line. Well, you're the big fat ninja everyone's mm-hmm. talking about. Yep. And uh, and and that's when you know it just begins to hit the fan. Police are coming. 
yada, yada, yada. They, he finally gets outside, and he's actually surrounded by police, and that's when we get go by showing up, throwing the smoke. Now, this scene was kind of weird to me because it was like, once go by throws the smoke, mm-hmm. right? And obviously, the way they set this up, obviously, when 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 police swarm in to arrest who we think is, is Haru, the camera work clearly shows that's not Haru that they just cuffed up, which makes me wonder. I've never been arrested, but I'm pretty sure when you're arresting a perp or somebody you may think is a perp, or somebody you may want to uh, frame as a perp, you want to get a good look at this person, right? When you arrest somebody who is 300 something pounds, the person you put in the back of the squad car yeah, is like lean as a sun like bitch. a buck 50. It's like so nobody with a, with a beautiful luxurious hair. Right. Nobody noticed that. Yeah, you know, and that's the only thing I appreciate this movie for, making the LAPD look like some dumb asses cuz they they pulled that off fantastic. Quite well. Quite well. Cuz this one dude that you've been seeing throughout the movie, you still can't catch him and it take these perfectly placed brands or as it was described, a tattoo. It's like these perfectly placed tattoos. So you'd be like, that's him. Now, that's when um, um, Go By and Haru both pay the uh, sensei a visit. The, yeah, to uh, the Enlightened Mountains. To right. the Enlightened Mountains, right. And then it was, uh, now, another part that made me kind of giggle is that we do see Go By in his prison jumpsuit. Mm-hmm. And then since it's like, I have to escape from jail, man. <laughs> but you know what? Did you notice that the jumpsuit he had on was a maximum security jumpsuit? It was. I'm like, nigga, what did, you, what did he do? <laughs> it was. It wasn't like and this entire time you didn't realize that this is not the same fat ass that we just saw. Yeah, it, it wasn't like it wasn't like a, like a holding tank jumpsuit. Like you you have been sent up state for quite some time, right? So basically, since they puts go by on hold because Haru's coming up, and even his spirit is just fat and bumbling, and it goes back to what I was saying about the movie. Like they literally at this time was basing everything off Chris Farley being fat. And full of energy and just dumb. Mm-hmm. And I guess at that time it's so, but then it's like, well, where's where's the comedy? It wasn't there. It makes no sense. But uh, of course, once again, in, in some you know comedies, we get uh, uh, Haru speaking with Sensei, and the first thing he wants to do is he wants to praise Go by, mm-hmm. saying that you know I want him to know that I love him. That's my brother, you know. Uh, Which was the most misplaced quote, like. You weren't thinking about go by this entire time. Now that you're in the mountains of enlightenment or whatever the hell it's called, all of a sudden you want to praise this dude. And nothing didn't make sense. He said, hide behind those clouds. How do you hide and you're a ghost or whatever the hell you are? <laughs> like none of that shit made sense, man. Fuck this movie. But, Seriously. But, but, they, but they definitely showed go by uh, hiding. Hiding behind the clouds. Hiding. <laughs> <laughs> but everything in here is translucent and you're hiding behind something. So this is when we... When, we uh, we get back down to uh, to Earth, and now Sensei has pretty much given uh, uh, Haru the the encouragement words to go out and finish out his his uh, his mission. And somehow through ninjutsu magic, he dropped off a medallion and a ninja outfit. Mm-hmm. This is when we get uh, Chris Rock, who wants to be uh, taken more seriously as the apprentice. Haru decides to blindfold himself while guiding Chris Rock. To drive where he needs to go. He was trying to say it was like off of ninja muscle memory. Off of ninja muscle memory. And then one of the dumbest fucking scenes ever is that, oh, I hear water. So he drives towards water. And, and these two fools decide to drive through a car wash, top down, the whole nine, still thinking he's hearing water. Mm-hmm. So, and that he's in the water as well. Like, well. We're actually in the water now, exactly. We make ourselves over to um, to the actual factory where the bad guys are hanging out. Where the big uh, uh, showdown's gonna happen. This is my, this is one of my first, no, not my first, but definitely one of the most standout, terrible CGI placements in this movie. And that's when we get Chris Farley climbing a palm tree, all the way to the top, and he's he's able to rock it back this, and forth. This rubber, super duper rubbery ass palm tree. <laughs> rock it back and forth to, and that can hold his big ass. Right. And then when he finally decides to, you know, jump off the palm tree to go through the uh, through the window, have you noticed, I'm sure you didn't notice this, when the CGI comes into place, when he's on the palm tree and then you look at, to where he's trying to go, that palm tree is nowhere near as high to the window he's, he's actually aiming for. Mm-hmm. So when he actually jumps off the palm tree, you literally watch his body go up and then back down and kind of 
curves to the left a bit to make sure that he hits the actual window. This movie defies all laws. All laws of gravity. <laughs> and which, by the way, Chris Rock's dumbass character does the same thing. But we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. So one thing that we didn't mention, and again, this movie is very forgettable. So we've definitely jumped past a lot of things. But if you've seen this it's movie, I'm this pretty movie. sure you understand why. They uh, Martin finds out that his girl is helping Veru because mm-hmm. he's driving past... Um, I want to say tailing. No, he's getting away from the cops. Right. And he sees his girl in a phone booth calling the cops. Mm-hmm. And he instantly recognized that. And he's like, funny running into you. So fast forward, he tied her up. He put a bomb in the actual warehouse, the printing press warehouse. Mm-hmm. And now that's what leads Chris Farley to go on the rescue mission with Chris Rock. Mm-hmm. So now he's in the printing press and he gets discovered. And he's getting his ass whooped. In comes Liu Kang. Who finally reveals, I've been telling you this entire time, you're my brother, let's kick ass together. And you get the classic back-to-back sequence. Well, with, with, to the background music of Kung Fu fighting. Haru finds out where Allison is. Mm. Crashes a forklift through the actual wall that she's stuck in. And he's about to disarm the bomb. Mm. And then he hears his brother, Liu Kang, getting his ass kicked. Mm. He sees it happening. And after being a bumbling idiot the entire movie, not couldn't, couldn't fight to save his life, now all of a sudden he becomes a ninja master. Everybody was kung fu fighting. <laughs> Who made that song? Uh, uh, I must say Carl Thomas. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> as long as many hits, uh, summer rain, and kung fu fight. <laughs> I don't know somebody Thomas though, I, 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 or, or Carl some something. It was somebody, but but that that's when he finally becomes the super duper kung fu warrior that I guess in a sense we all expected him to become. Uh huh. Uh-huh. The fight scene is just so cheesy because. You got the dude with the goatee, and then you get the uh, another guy in red jogging suit. Two guys in red jogging suit, because this is when Chris Rock comes in. You're right. So it's three of them. It's okay. Jen, and it's two guys in red jumpsuits dressed the exact same. That's another thing I didn't get. Why were all the henchmen dressed the same? Who paid for these jumpsuits? Uh, my- what was the meeting like? Like, you know what? We're going to be villainous. Red jumpsuits for everybody. We're all about to look like the More Money, More Problems video. Let's do it. So I guess that these are three best fighters Amongst all of the henchmen. Mm-hmm. Chris Rock is trying to imitate Chris Farley because he wants to be a ninja. Mm-hmm. So now he's rocking back and forth on the literal rubber tree plant. And goes crashing through the window onto one of the henchmen. Which leaves Jin and other jumpsuit henchmen. And they do the, the scissor kick towards each other. And yes. And pretty much destroy each other's balls in the process. And then that fight ends with one punch. To the face. One punch to the face. Yes, yep. sir. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. At this at this moment right now, I know the bomb is now what two two, two minutes, minutes something like that. two and a half minutes left. Mm-hmm. So um, the weirdest turn of events after we get the conversation between between Haru and Martin, and now all of a sudden Haru is really good at fucking dodging bullets with the sword. Mm-hmm. Martin breaks out. He he gets to his uh, his getaway car, but as he's thinking, it's something about the scene. I, I just <clears throat> it didn't make much sense, but I, but I feel like. I feel like they were writing this scene as filming was taking place because it, it. I'm sure this didn't make sense on paper. I don't think they wrote this. I think, like, I guarantee if they bring, they put out pictures of this movie being filmed. There's a lot of scenes where the writer and director just sitting there scratching their head, like, uh, what like you know, what you know that put here? You know what people look like when they're thinking, like, uh, you know, what I'm saying. I'm pretty sure it's plenty of photos like that. <laughs> so I'm gonna assume he, he grabs this, this, like, this, this. Uh, arrow thing. I, I can't describe what the fuck it actually like a, is. Yeah, I, yeah. The, why is there a javelin at a printing press? <laughs> yeah, like, I'm not sure why is that's why that's there. But so many questions. He uses it to what to what he makes is to break it to where um, Allison is. It goes completely through Allison onto no, no, you. Damn, you just murdered Allison just like that. I mean, not through Allison, but it goes past where she's at. And it goes through the room into the uh, cargo area of the truck to which Martin is in and is about to escape. Now, this part is weird because when he sh- actually shoots the little whatever the hell it is, it takes off pretty straight. And when it goes through the, the, the room that Allison is in, it literally falls flat onto the cargo area of, of the truck. Hooks onto what? And you know what's funny about that truck? <laughs> what does it hook onto? What's funny about that truck, Martin actually... Threw a driver out the truck. Here's my question. All this shit was going on. You were sitting in this truck. 
You saw we was going through all this stress. You just sitting in this truck staring forward. He had his headphones on. He, he didn't know what was, what was going on. <laughs> that was the most misplaced. Why couldn't the truck just be empty? <laughs> nah. Because Susie, get out of here. I was like, where he been at? <laughs> you been the whole time? <laughs> you been here this entire time. No one knew you was here this entire movie. And now all of a sudden, you're just in this lone truck just here like, well, just waiting to get the signal to drive off. <laughs> so the arrow goes through the room where Alice is in. And then the little stand that he's on pulls him through, pulls the actual uh, stand through the room where Allison is in, yanking the bomb with her out to where the car, the cargo truck to where Martin's trying to escape. Mm. Bomb eventually goes off. Martin escapes again. I'm like. No, he didn't escape. No, he, he didn't die. But he didn't escape, though. Remember when the bomb goes off and he falls out the truck? Doesn't have the sense to run because the next scene he's getting arrested. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Everybody's trying to clear everything up, and out of all people getting interviewed, Chris Rock is Chris getting Rock interviewed, getting interview, yeah. and he's taking all the credit as the ninja that stopped all of this stuff. Now, here's my issue: if we're going off of life, did he go back to being a bellman? Nah, I think if there was ever a Beverly Hills Ninja two, it would star Chris Rock. I'm glad they they knew they yeah. didn't want to see that. Yeah, I, I'd say it would star Chris Rock, but. He, he he gets his 15 minutes of fame, and then we get back to uh, the actual uh, dojo where Haru is with uh, his people. Uh, go by is, you know, he's, he's he's wheelchair bound, but he's back with his people, back with Sensei. And then there's Allison. And at this moment right now, he's saying goodbye to his people so he can go back to uh, Beverly Hills with Allison. That's right. They just pop back up in a relationship. But my note here says, but before he goes... He has to drag go by with him to the very end. Because for some reason, there was a grappling hook attached to go by's wheelchair that was also attached to the truck. Just conveniently placed to go by. I hate this movie. <laughs> I hate this movie. And then you notice that when the truck took off, oh, and just and just to tell you guys what's going on, the truck takes off and go by goes jetting down the, the street, hits a rock and goes flying. Now, I definitely saw him on his way down to hit some rocks. And then out of nowhere, he's flying like 30 feet in the air to land in this treacherous ass water, which it seems to be super duper still when you actually see him in the water itself. This movie was not planned. No, it wasn't. But that's it. It's done. Yeah. Literally, that's the movie. (laughs) It literally ends with the end. If this movie was hard to follow through our review, trust me. It's just as bad when you watch it. It's just as bad when you watch the movie. Oh, my goodness. So, should we get the takeaways? I guess, man. Let's go. <laughs> I'm ready to wrap this shit up. So. I know. Takeaways. Takeaways is a part of the show where we uh, we, we give out our awards. We give out our that guy award. That's our favorite uh, male character. We have that that chick award, which is our favorite female character. Obviously, we have our this fool award, which is uh, a character we did not like. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm very curious to know what your this fool award is going to be. Mm. Uh, we have our cut that out, which is going to be uh, a scene that we felt like just did not belong in this movie. And then we have, of course, the BTTC iconic movie moment. And as a guest of our show, Los, who is getting your that guy award? My That Guy Award has to go to Haru. Okay. It goes to Haru because this man was a dumbass the entire movie and still accomplished what he was trying to get done. Okay. So I don't know if that means he's truly the white ninja or every villain in L.A. is dumb as fuck. I don't know which one it is. I'm going to say the latter. But either way it goes, this man beat two murder cases, (laughs) oblivious to all the things going on, and he still accomplished what he had to do. So I'm going to have to give that guy to Haru. My that guy award is gonna go to go by. Go by. He didn't have to do what he did. He didn't have to be down. But he didn't want to do what he did. He didn't want to do what he did. But he was down. He got fucked up in the process. He had to cross dress. He had to. Uh, he got hit in the head with a uh, with a satellite dish for the sake of just being there for his brother. So for me, my that guy award is going to go by. I do that for you. I wouldn't be in that situation. I know, but in case you was, I do that for you. Who's getting the uh, that chick award? You know what? There weren't too many options. So obviously, Alice. Alice. <laughs> Literally, it just hit me. This is the most sexist movie ever. There's mm-hmm. one woman in this entire mm-hmm. movie. If you don't count the strippers, if you don't count the strip, you can't say stripper one. So, you know what? Fuck that. I'm giving it to stripper one because we got to see uh, Haru in his true element, mm-hmm. and he, she introduced the, the the Chippendales dance mm-hmm. of Chris Farley. So, my that chick award goes to stripper number one. 
Uh, my bad chick award is obviously going to Allison slash uh, what was her other name? Allison and Sally Jones. Sally Jones. Uh, because simply she's the only chick in the movie. Mm-hmm. Moving on. Uh, this fool award. This fool award has to go to Jen. Whatever his name is. Go T, right? Yeah, go yeah. brother Go T. Mm-hmm. It has to go to Jen because from the beginning of the movie when the bad guys are introduced to when they're caught, this man stood by Martin's side this entire time, and you find out that he's this big counterfeit criminal that doesn't know what the hell he's doing. I thought he was mute. He didn't say too much anything in the whole movie. He, I mean, but you know, he, he's the one that delivered all the news. He's the reason that they found out, and that's another reason why he's that fool, because he was being way too descriptive at the docks. Mm. <laughs> so... He's that fool because, one, he don't know how to just, you know, summarize and talk in code. And, two, he followed this dude who clearly didn't know what the hell he was doing. Mm. And he always had to bail him out by whooping somebody ass or by killing somebody. So, he's definitely that fool. My This Fool Award is going to have to go to Haru. Simply because he is supposed to be the fool of this movie. Yeah, yeah. So, I I can't really explain it better. He falls through shit. Shit falls on him. Is Yeah, Haru. We'll, we'll leave it at that. Mm-hmm. Uh, cut that out. Um, The movie. <laughs> um, That's my note as well. Yeah. That's at least, my a, at well. least an hour and 20 minutes. And by the way, the movie's an hour and 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. But definitely the movie. If I have to choose an actual thing to cut out the movie, I'd cut out all of Chris Rock's character. It was unneeded. It was unnecessary extra five. I mean, other than the beginning, they could have found a way to just write him out from there. But I'd, I'd cut out um, Chris Rock's character for sure. My cut that out is going to be the same. I put the whole movie in. The reason why I say it's the whole movie is um, um, you can tell this was just a last minute attempt to really show the world like hey Chris Farley is still a star guys hey now he's, he's still doing stuff you know come on now this was this was not it though this wasn't the this one this was not it this was definitely one of the one but you know for a movie that really if you watch it one time you will definitely forget about it after a while it was hard to get through this whole thing it was it was difficult it was hard because you know unlike you know those old classic um, sound flicks you can really kind of you know sink your teeth into it, really get into it. It's hard to get through this movie. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to lie. It's hard. I, I mean, the one little small giggle that I I did get from it, I was like, so, so that's it? I didn't have a single anything. Not even a, <laughs> none, nothing throughout this movie. <laughs> All right. Um, the iconic moment for you. The credits. It was. I knew it was over. Okay. And that's honestly my answer. Nothing stands out about this movie to me whatsoever. Well, mine is going to be uh, the turning Japanese song in its placement because it has nothing to do with with, the, with the Japan. But as he's in L.A., driving up and down the street, going back and forth, the turning Japanese, I'm turning Japanese, mm-hmm. has nothing to do with the movie in itself. But I think that movie, that song was so iconic for the 90s, it had to be placed somewhere in there. Right. You know what I mean? So, yeah, for, for me, my... my uh, Iconic moment is, is the turning Japanese song and placement. I, and I kind of just figured out where they were. They had to be in Japan. The mm-hmm. only reason I'm saying that, not just not just because of the turning Japanese, but I think he mentioned while he was in the dojo that um, they practice the art of ninjutsu, and mm-hmm. that is a Japanese art. So putting two and two together, they were in Japan. Huh. No, I, just had, I had to just get that back in there because I... I felt like I was just saying they were in an Asian place. <laughs> so I, I think that's just as racist as the rest of this movie. <laughs> well, that's Takeaways with Big Los. We'll, we're going to get into a Quick Hits and wrap this whole thing up. Quick Hits is a part of the show where we go through our fun facts for the movie about uh, scenes that were added, scenes that were taken out, uh, fun production facts, and then we'll uh, talk briefly about why did or why didn't they do that. So Quick Hits, let's go. According to Bernie Brillstein, Chris Farley was so disappointed in this film that he cried on Brillstein's shoulder after the first screening. So he knew this was a he piece of shit. He knew this was a piece of shit. Yo, how can you feel as a director that my star is crying on my shoulder? And you're the one that, that supplied the laughs in this well, movie. Well, Brillstein, I think he's a producer. Produce? It doesn't matter. If you're in any Dennis guy. Dennis Dugan directed the same guy who did uh, like Big Daddy and shit. 
Really? Yeah, so he's well into that SNL circle for sure. Chuck Lorre's cousin or something like that. But can you imagine that? Can you imagine something that you're a part of, something that you're bringing to the big screen? That's your name as well. And the star who's supposed to be responsible for the laughs is crying because the movie's horrible? It's like, so whose fault is that? Wow. The writer. Oh, yeah. The studio. I don't, man. He'd have got that. Diddy and Steve Stout ass whooping. <laughs> like, bro, you serious? Why would you put me in this shit? Uh, Chris, you know it was written for Chris Farley. Yeah. Well, well, no. No, actually, it wasn't. I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, Christian Bell has stated on multiple occasions that this is his favorite film. Christian Bell, really? Batman. Batman, Batman. Oh. yeah. Christian, Christian Bell. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. You know what? We're not going to shed no light on that. We're going to keep going. Uh, According to Bradley Jinkle, Chris Farley demanded that Chris Rock co-star in the film and would not do the film without Rock. He probably realized this is going to be stupid. We need somebody else. But if you're going to get that Chris Rock to be just that, like you could have got anybody. So I was right. So they did just say, please write something for this man. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. The title role was originally written for Dana Carvey. So technically, Beverly Hills Ninja would have starred Danny Carvey. So this, so there's a way they could have made Beverly Hills Ninja worse. Because Dana, there is nothing. There is absolutely nothing funny about Dana Carvey. Well, come on, that's Garth. You know what I'm saying? That, that's Garth. Was that your favorite character in Wayne's World? That's my favorite Dana Carvey character. And how many favorite characters? What's your What's your solid second? Exactly. Exactly. Uh. There's Garth, and then there's the Master of Disguise. You can't name another role Dana Carvey has done. Nah, and, and I'm not going to talk about Master of Disguise. That movie's fucking terrible. Terrible. That movie's trash. Yeah. The only thing that's ever been attached to Dana Carvey's name is Gabosh. Gobsh. Gobsh. Chris Farley's brothers appear in the film as cops right before he disappears behind the cloud of smoke. So was that like Kevin Farley and... Peter Farley. Was it Peter? No, that's Peter Farley. So I think it's like oh, John yeah, yeah, Farley yeah, yeah. or some shit. That's some... Real but, ass name. But I know Kevin Farley was also in that uh, that weird MTV uh, pop group. Uh, together. T- yeah, together. Yeah, yeah I remember that. <laughs> they tried it. It was like, no, we need a new Chris Farley. And they was like, this ain't going to work. Let nope. him die. Nope, nope. Uh, Chris Farley was injured on the set while doing one of his own stunts. While he was trying to hide like a ninja and jump through the wall, during one take, he dove into the wall and hit a stud, which did not break. Hmm. Slowed his ass down, though. But that's... That's, that's been his thing. Like, even his most iconic SNL skit, he went crashing through a table that was not supposed to break. Nope. And it did. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, one of Chris Farley's final movie roles before his death on December 18th, 1997. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it makes you think, if he actually completed Shrek, would that be as big as it is now? I don't. You know what? Honestly, I don't think he would. Because it, and the reason why I say that and once again, God bless the dead, but I feel like Chris Farley, unfortunately, would have been one of those, one of those, those stars who eventually his star will fade away. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, he doesn't have that same power like other fat comedians, like, uh, who's popping right now that's fat? Kevin James? He, but you know, you can't really count that as fat comedian. Kevin James is seen, Kevin James is seen as an overweight comedian. Mm-hmm. Kevin James seen as an out of shape comedian. Chris Farley, I think, was the last of the successful fat comedians. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Because before him was John Candy, mm-hmm. and um, I think that that style of comedy just died. Just like, died out. You know, I think that, that that entire style of comedy where it's just slapstick and Three Stooges type deal. I think all of that just kind of died out. So I think he may have he may literally be the last of the Mohicans. Before he he himself passed away. You know what I kept thinking when I was watching this movie? This is a bad live reenactment of Kung Fu Panda. Or is Kung Fu Panda a, a, a bad animated version of Beverly Hills Ninja? No, we're going to give all the credit to Kung Fu Panda. I don't care if it came <laughs> after. We're going to give all the credit to Kung Fu Panda for originating the fat, bumbling idiot. Well, I enjoy Kung Fu Panda. I didn't enjoy this. Exactly. Uh, last one. Chris Farley's name in the movie, Haru, means spring in Japanese. 
But those are all the quick hits for this movie. Those are all the quick hits for this. So movie. There was nothing. There was nothing interesting that happened. By one of the quick hit, understand people. One of the quick hits was about an actor who didn't start acting until well after. Fuck this movie. Yeah. <laughs> so to wrap it up, uh, if Hollywood was to make a uh, a, 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 a reboot or a sequel to Beverly Hills Ninja, is it getting Los's uh, twelve dollars? No. 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 Mm-mm. Um. And, and you still feel like forty percent on Rotten Tomatoes is it's generous. It's pretty generous. Oh, okay. It's very giving. Gosh. And I think, and you know what? I don't think it would have that fourteen percent if Chris Farley didn't die. <laughs> I I look at I look at that fourteen percent as Kobe getting on the um, the All Star team on his way out. Mm. That was just generosity. Well, there you have it. Uh, Beverly Hills Ninja. Twenty years later, uh, I can tell you right now, I likely will not watch this movie anytime soon. Nope. Um, I think I'm good. Uh, Chris Farley, uh, you will be missed. Meanwhile, Chris Rogers still doing much, much better shit. Los, we as BTTC would like to thank you wholeheartedly for being on the show with us today, stepping in last minute. Um, uh, shout out to my partner in crime, Kay Williams, who'll be back with us again next week. Um, shout out to... Uh, all of the the, uh, the Beat Network crew, Lex, Truth, uh, Kev, uh, love all you guys. Los, let the good people know where they can find you, man. You can find me at Big Los UTC on Twitter. You can also find me on Facebook. Um, I wish I could say I, I, I'm glad to be here, but I would like to say from the bottom of my heart, the pit of my soul, go to hell. Because <laughs> I having to watch this movie, having to sit through this hour and a half of just... Got it. It's just like watching death. Literally sitting back watching death. Like, I can't do anything about this because I'm. It's, it's happening. Garbage. It was just complete. It was just. It was just a skid mark in film history, man. Like a legit Chris Farley skid mark. There you go. Imagine that. What a Chris Farley skid mark would look like. And that's how I felt. Don't don't forget to check for Los's show, The Noise with Hollywood Kev, every Sunday on the uh, Beat Network page and iTunes or Spreaker. And all that other good stuff. Where can they find you at, sir? Oh, they can find me on all the social medias at uh, I am Jay Alonzo. That's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. You talk to me and I'll talk back. Real Talk episodes will be back up very soon. Uh, I think we're catching, oh, geez, we're sleepless. We're catching Live By Night. We're catching a bunch of stuff this weekend. So, yeah, look out for those movie reviews because they are coming. Uh, and besides that, we're out of here, man. We'll see you guys next week. Los, we thank you one more time. Kay, we look forward to having you back on the show next week, my brother. We're done. I'll see y'all Sunday, man. Back to the classics. We're out of here. Deuces.